InfoSec community here for about three years. Um, I've done computers for a lot, lot longer, but InfoSec, you know, for there. Before that, I was been a new. I had a lot of jobs. One of them, I was a drill sergeant in the army. I won't make anyone do push-ups. I won't yell. Uh, but uh, when in basic training in the army, there are certain like core tools. I mean, if you're going to be a soldier, you have to be good at shooting a rifle. You know, just it's it's fundamental. And I think actually Nmap kind of falls in infosec. It's one of the, again those core tools like like Wireshark Nmap. Those are tools that you, you know once you they're core. So uh, what I've done we got to about half an hour for the presentation. The URL at the bottom is uh, I've got uh, the presentation and the sh example scripts that we're going to go through. So don't worry about taking notes. As long as you download the Git repo, you're going to have everything. Uh, we're going to go through examples. Uh, the reality is you're going to have to run the scans to get it fully and to get comfortable with it. So that's why I made materials so you can go ahead and do it again. The more you do it, the more it will be familiar to you. So obviously the first question is what is Nmap? And if you think about you know, Google Earth and finding uh, buildings and then finding doors to buildings. You can kind of use that parable. Basically, you know, host discovery, in fact, yes, next slide. Host discovery, you know, like what machines exist on this subnet or even bigger. What ports are open on that machine? And more detail about the machine. Well, not just what ports are open, what services are running, what versions are running. And it also can uh, fingerprint a uh, OS so that when it's through with the scan it compares the results and it'll tell you with a degree of confidence what operating system is running on the machine. It's not absolute but you know, the results are pretty good. And then uh, additional functionality through the Nmap scripting engine. Basically you can add programmatically enhance the capabilities of Nmap and we're going to go through some of that. Well, that's, in a nutshell, what N Nmap can do. Uh, because we're scanning people don't like people, uh, don't like getting scanned. I don't know if it's legal or illegal, but I'm going to cover myself. So, obviously, get written explicit permission uh, before you scan somebody, unless you own it. Um, this what URL at the bottom. If you're going, if you're in the court in in the class and you're going to try some of the examples, this is a URL a host ran by uh, the guy who wrote Nmap, and he explicitly says on the page you can scan this machine. So if you can't spin up some VMs to play with it, I would say go uh, you know scan this host. You've been given permission. Uh, ways to get it, I mean, most of us will be on Kali or some type of Linux. Uh, so, you know, package management, probably the best option. I like it because, you know, updating and managing the files, just it's easy that way. Uh, binaries, if you're not on Linux, that's probably the best or the most convenient way to put it in. And it is open source. So, obviously, if you want to compile it, most people don't, but if you do, that's great. Now, most of what we're going to go through is a command line environment using Nmap. But the, it's actually got a GUI. It's actually a really good GUI. Um, I still do a lot of command line, but the nice thing about it is you're learning Nmap. Is the, if you use Zenmap, which is the GUI, you, uh, it'll actually show the different options. So if you don't know everything and you're just still filling it out, uh, using Zenmap is a good way to learn the tool. And it's also included in Kali, so the, uh, you by default. Now, when I say a port scanner, you know, most of us probably understand what that means, but just to make sure that we understand. Basically, a port would be if a, if a host was an apartment building, then a, uh, each apartment would be like a port and a door where you can knock on and see who's available and if they, if they answer and what's available on that port or uh, that door. Um, you know, there's some that are pretty well established. We know about those. 
one thing to take in mind is that if you want to run a service on from port 1 to 124, most of the time the operating system will require that you have a, a, some type of privileged user to run a service. So, you know, if you port, port 80, HAE, HTTP, so on and so forth. Now, on the uh, IP header, a port uh, is given uh, basically 16 bits of possible address space, which basically means about 65,000 possible ports on each machine. One thing by default with Nmap is they will scan by default, unless you specify to sc uh, scan otherwise, it'll do the thousand most popular ports, the most commonly used ports. And I'm, I'm going to show you the configuration option where you can actually say, let's use them all. Obviously, that costs you in time. Uh, usually, we consider a port open in, for general reason if you can if you, it responds. If it doesn't respond, closed. And some ports, especially when you go with UDP, and you may n the results because it's the def it's not a definitive process may be hard to ascertain if that port's actually open or not. Speaking of which. TCP uh, is a very, you know, again, most of you know about this, but has a very definitive connection process. You're either connected, it's either open or it's not. And it has re uh, reliability features built into it. UDP, best effort. Um, so uh, UDP scans will take a lot longer. If you're port scanning for UDP, I'll show you how, but it will take a long time and just accept that that's the way it is. The thing about it is, say, if you're doing a syslog, like port 514, uh, that's usually by default UDP, and you have to scan, uh, you do a UDP scan if you want to find out if that's open. For TCP, the reason why we know that it will, con uh, the connection's fairly established is it does what's called the three-way handshake. I want to talk to you. Yes, let's talk. Okay. You know, that type of uh, approach. The, uh, there's different ways you can scan where you can either go with the whole uh, uh, connection process or uh, you can actually just get a resp the initial response and not complete that handshake. It's faster, especially if you're scanning a lot of ports and a lot of hosts. There, there's some advantages to not doing the full three-way handshake. Uh, Nmap does a lot. It doesn't just scan the port. What it will do is it'll, okay, I've got, the, these are the machines I want to reach. It'll, uh, it'll try to discover the host. Usually we, we call that ping, except it doesn't just do ICMP. It actually tries to connect on 443 and port 80. So say if you have a firewall that blocks ICMP, it can still discover a host if it can reach it on port 80. So a little, a little different ping than you would normally think. It'll try to do reverse DNS, um, obviously the port scan, which you all know about. It'll actually try to find out what uh, service is, is running if you include the right option. I'll show you that. And it also kind of fingerprinting. Trace route, not frequently used, it's there. And also if you're writing a script, it will show you that. And then obviously the output. There's, uh, but you can turn off some of these features. You're not always running it. But this is the sequence it works into. So uh, port, uh, if you want to find out if the hosts exist, but you don't want a port scan right away, you just want host discovery, the first option you see is the option that will, it won't do port scanning. It'll just try to discover the host. So if you're for time, you don't want to port scan the entire subnet, you just want to see what hosts are there, maybe port scan specific ports, that's useful. The second option uh, doesn't try to discover. And in one of the scans I'm going to show you later on, that's desirable. And the last one is actually kind of an interesting one. You, most of these can be done over the internet. But if you want to scan machines that you're on the local network to, and maybe they're not even running like in a TCP uh, or any of those services, but they're local to a network and they're up. 
the PR will actually do an ARP scan. And so for local host discovery, that's, that's a neat trick. Doesn't work over the internet, but local network. Another uh, type of scan, this is the, simple, uh, the more uh, kind of straightforward scan, TCP. It does the full three-way uh, three handshake. You do not have to be privileged in OS in order to perform a connect scan. It does the full handshake, comes back with the results. And the bottom is an example of that. The uh, scan where you don't do the full three-way handshake and faster, especially if you're doing a lot of hosts and a lot of ports, is the SYN scan. And if you're root on a system, NenMap will try to optimize the scan, and will do this will be the default. And what it will do is it'll do the SYN. As soon as, as, soon as it gets the SYN act, it will be done. It won't do the last act, and that will speed up the results. But you have to be privileged, obviously. UDP scan. Uh, it takes time. The pr uh, but it's the only way to find out I what, if the UDP services are available on a machine. So while I would say that I, it's not the first scan I would do against a machine, it eventually it does have enough value to do. It just might not be the first thing you do. So. Uh, the UV is important because we're going to talk about version detection. If you're going to spend the time doing a, a, T, a UDP scan, adding a V flag enhances the results you're going to get back from the scan. Two scans, they're kind of interesting in what the way they could do it, are Christmas and null scans. In TCP or in, U, uh, in IP, actually TCP, there are some flags like SYN, SYNAC, and so forth. Uh, what it does is it turns on some of those flags, kind of breaking some of the rules. But it can go in, uh, re, uh, fi uh, discover hosts in a unique way. Sometimes they call this kind of what they call a stealth scan because it in the past, a machine might not have recognized that it's actually being interrogated. But I wouldn't count on that for stealth anymore. One thing is, it, uh, it depends on the standard, on the host on the other end, following the standards, the RFCs. And Windows is known not to follow the standards with this. So what happens is if you scan Windows hosts, this, the results you get from this may not be that good. Just expect that. And this is probably the most interesting scan what it is, it, when, you're, when you're running an idle scan, what happens is there's a machine, your host, your target host. But you don't want the target host to, uh, to see that it's getting scanned by you. So what you do is you, uh, uh, you forge that you're sending it from another machine. That machine has to be idle, basically not doing a lot. Like that dusty print network printer, that's a, a good example of a host you would use for that. So what happens is you send the request, but you say that you're the idle machine. What, before you send a request, you check the idle machine. It will respond with a sequence ID. You send a request. If that port is open, it will respond back to the idle machine and actually increase the sequence number. Then you can request from that idle machine. And if you see the sequence number moving up, you're effectively able to discover what ports are open on a machine without that machine that you're scanning seeing that it's coming from you. It's the real stealth scan. The thing that kind of makes this one work or not work is that idle machine really has to be idle because if it's doing other things then that sequence ID will not work for you. Does that make sense? Cool. Uh, for version detection. Besides just knowing if a port is open or not, it's you find out what uh, program is running and usually what version. A lot of uh, software programs will, uh, will come back and say Apache version whatever or SSH version whatever. And the benefit is if you're trying to attack a machine is you know if you know oh this, ver this software this version I think there's an exploit for that. And so you're getting more uh, it gives you more value out of the scan by getting the version detecting version. 
And basically, each service, a lot of services will have banners, and it basically will display that banner as they do the port scan. Uh, dash O is basically what it'll do is it'll attempt to fingerprint as it scans, and it'll come back and look at the results of that scan against the fingerprints that Nmap has. And it'll, and it'll tell you, hey, I think this is Linux, I think this is Windows, I think this is Mac, I think it's this version. And the value in that is, again, you know, your, your recon, you know, in the, phrase, in the phase that you're reconning information, it's useful to, to know. The more you know, the better, right? So that's, that's good for recon. The only thing I'd say, and the reason why I'd warn, well, actually, is that, you know, if you're trying to be discreet, you know, uh, port scanning is not necessarily that discreet. And we're actually going to show some options for that. Uh, in fact, this next option, which is timing, what it is is you can, yeah, by default it has basically be between I think one or zero and five. By default, it's at three. So what happens? You can up, you can go to like say four or five. You'll get results faster, but sometimes the res results will actually not be as good. It's rushing, and the results may suffer from that. Now, a reason why you might slow it down is that when you, if you ever wire, uh, turn on Wireshark and then port scan somebody, it's obvious that you can see that someone's port scanning. If you slow it down, it won't be this big rush of traffic, and maybe you might not be as obvious. You know, try to, yeah, hide the fact that you're port scanning somebody. Uh, one is fast. Uh, or sorry, five is fast, one is slow. Sorry, yes. Good question. Uh, now, as, uh, as far as uh, timeouts, uh, what happens is sometimes it, put, it makes a request, but it will wait for quite some time be before it will, you'll move on to the next one. And you can actually specify, hey, don't wait more than this. And the benefit is obviously if there's got latency or that machine, if you skipped host discovery, then you know, you're going to be trying to port scan something that doesn't exist. By putting a timeout, you save yourself some time. It doesn't, it won't go on and wait for, for a longer period of time. Now, you if usually if you run it, it'll show output to the screen. But you may actually want to use Nmap to feed another tool. Like there may be some type of other uh, Nessus or other vulnerability scanner that you want to take the results the, from your Nmap scan and feed it into the vulnerability scanner. So Nmap allows you to format your output in a few different ways. N is just what you usually see on the screen. X is XML. Uh, S is script kitty, and it's kind of an interesting. I suggest you do that at least once. I know what utility is, but it looks a little fun to look at. G is greppable, which if you're going to feed and then do analytics with being grepping certain things, it'll make it a little bit more useful. And A is all. It'll actually do it in all the formats and output it. So if you want to feed something else or evaluate it after, the, after your scan, uh, specifying output, useful. Now, that was actually basically the functionality. Nmap started out just as a port scanner. And you can write a port scanner about what? Eight lines of Python. But it, uh, the about middle part of the last decade, Google sponsored a, a you know, summer of code and they added the Nmap scripting engine to Nmap. And it's really added a lot more functionality. It's, it's really enhanced what it can do for you. And we're, we are going to hit it, but also Jason, who is going to present after this, is going to hit just that part. But, uh, yeah, there are a lot of scripts. Even if you don't want to write scripts, there are about 500 of them. If you usually in uh, Kali, it's users, share, and map scripts, and you'll see uh, like 500 or more, probably more now, that you can use already. You don't have to write anything, just use it. Now, they usually, the scripts are, you know, like some scripts are pretty gentle, and some scripts 
might actually take a machine down if, if you aren't careful. So they've categorized them. I mean, some you're actually trying to do something malicious like denial service, right? Uh, and usually they will exist at least in one or two categories. Usually like you'll have kind of like default and intrusive. Usually, you know, they won't obviously won't be in either, they won't be in both of those, but usually a script will be at least one of those. They're written in Lua, so just quick question. Who here has ever scripted World of Warcraft? There has to be someone in here, right? Okay, don't feel bad. But uh, it, they use Lua, which is the same uh, scripting engine that uh, World of Warcraft uses. So if you're familiar with that, the, sh the syntax will feel formal, uh, familiar. They have a, ba a basic fr um, pattern that they all have. And I'm actually going to show you some very simple examples of how that how it looks. Uh, when you're writing your own scripts and things are not working, the slash D flag is your best friend. It'll give you feedback. that will help you understand what's happening. And they actually have uh, in uh, Nmap a bunch of shared libraries. So instead of writing, if there's a common functionality, instead of writing it yourself, I recommend first looking in the libraries. You can probably save yourself writing a lot of code and use the libraries to do that. So here is an example of a, an, a sim the simplest Nmap script I could write. And basically at the top uh, where you, it ends with the line that says categories, that's the header. It's a lot of metadata, some information about it. That, that's, the, that's the header. The, uh, the rule part is that port rule to end. And all it does is, hey, if this port state looks like it's open, now I'm going to perform the action. So the port, if it doesn't pass the port rule or the rule, it doesn't perform the action. And the rule in this case is just going to say I'm open. Not that interesting. Probably the least useful in map script you're ever going to see. But it's useful for understanding the structure. So I have a practical example in here. And let me okay there. And let me cat my as okay. I've written a script and let me scroll up here. So you have my header, it's just the metadata, right? Not that interesting. What this script does is it, it's going to connect to a uh, like web server, get the certificate, look at the expiration date, and show it to me. And the use case uh, for this script is that I've got a ton of websites, I I've got SSL certs. And instead of maintaining an Excel spreadsheet, if I just want to know which one, when they come, when they're about to expire, this will give me results quickly on a lot of websites. That, uh, so that's what I'm going to use this script for. So I have the port rule. It basically looks to see if it's a valid SSL port. I have an additional in here, a little a helper function that just formats my string to something human readable. And then the last action is basically where it gets the cert, and then it, it runs it, and it outputs the exp expiration. So nothing super complicated. I'm going to run it. I'm going to show you. I'm going to use another. Actually, let me uh, clear this here. And then in the script, because I know that I only want 443, I can speed up my Nmap script by just specifying 443, I don't scan all the ports. Makes it faster. Then I'm going to run my script, which I just showed you. And with this under, under case I, upper, uh, uppercase L, what I'm basically saying is my input will be a list, and it will be this file. And I'm going to just show you the file. So like three websites that I run. Those are the ones I'm going to scan. So as I run the script, it'll come back fairly quickly. And what it'll do is it'll give me for each host when the expiration date is. Now, for three sites, that might not be too useful. But if you got like 600 or more sites, this is going to allow, this is an example of how Nmap can allow you to get information pretty quickly from the sites. Any questions on this script? 
I don't expect you to totally understand it, but just get the idea of what NMAP scripting can allow you to do. Cool. And if you, you're interested, and I hope you are, that's why you came here, and you want to learn more, there's obviously the page. The, there's network, NMAP network scanning is a big book, good book, I've got it. Um, you actually have most of that book on the website. Uh, NMAP Essentials was actually my first book that taught me how to get used to NMAP. Still, I think it's a good book. And if you just want a quick reference to NMAP, uh, SANS has an NMAP cheat sheet, kind of like the uh, trifolds that you've gotten in your bag as you came here. They have one specifically for NMAP. And again, I think that's, once, you're, once you've used it, you probably won't use that cheat sheet for a, a lot. But when you're getting used to using it, it's a good tool. So with that, and I think I have a little bit of time for questions. Any questions? Uh, go ahead, yes. Uh, there are scripts, you know, I told you, there's like, okay, the question was, is there a script for checking SSH that accepts passwords versus public key? Is that, yeah, idea? Okay, that's good uh, scan. There are a bunch of SSH scripts. In fact, let's go. I don't want to run over time, but let's see here. Let's see. Oh, no, no, no. I, I want to. Let's see what we can see. Scripts. Okay, LS. And say, so I do LS, SSH. And so it looks like there's, you know, in, they enumerate the algorithms used, uh, host keys. And if they check it for SSHB1. So there isn't one built in. But again, with NMAP scripting and with uh, uh, the class we're going to have, you might be able to write your own to do that, just that. Good question. Other questions? Well, if you don't remember anything else and you're not excited about NMAP, just let you know Trinity uses NMAP. For those of you who remember, uh, in uh, the second Matrix movie, uh, she used NMAP to discover that SSH was available and then used, a, at that time, a zero-day SSH nuke to hack into the power grid. So, you know, if, you can't, if you can hack the power grid with the NMAP, then it must be good. So, but thank you. I uh, appreciate you coming out.